Well, it is a pleasure to introduce you, Pastor Gary. Um, I think we have supported your ministry since the very beginning, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, that's been over 20 years now that we've had uh, been able to be blessed by Pastor Gary and his work. So we're going to be able to hear an update from him and as well as a message. So I'll turn it over to you, Pastor Gary. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Now, we're in San Antonio. Everybody here should be able to say, <laughs> Buenos, dias. Buenos dias. That's more like it. Praise God. That was wonderful. The youth leading the worship this morning. Wasn't that great? Praise God. I, it really encourages me. I, one, because it was, they, they did a good job. And then two, because uh, the youth are worshiping the Lord. There's a lot of other places our young people could be this morning. Besides up here leading a congregation and singing praise to Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. You know, it's not just India where... Uh, there's a hostility to the gospel. And we'll continue to pray for our brothers and sisters. They, we have a lot to learn from those that have uh, gone through the fire. But uh, the antagonism, the antipathy, the uh, hatred towards Christianity is growing, if you haven't noticed, uh, all over the world. And so that means that the cost for following Christ is increasing. Now, it, I, it's not always the same everywhere. We don't suffer as bad as they do over in India. Uh, but if, you, uh, if you're in this world, you will face tribulation. And uh, we're going to be facing an increasing amount of it to different degrees as we interact with this uh, very godless society uh, that we're a part of. So um, here's the question. Is it worth it? And our young people, the ones that are up here singing and praising God, you guys are going to be facing an increasing level of a society that just... Uh, basically defines everything that's evil and wrong with the world, they put that on Christianity. And so we need to face, is it worth it? My son's a student at a junior college. Well, both my sons are students in university. The oldest is in uh, Fort Worth uh, studying medicine. My youngest son who's with me today, Bracey, he's uh, at uh, Tyler Junior College. Uh, Tyler, Texas, up in East Texas, uh, is the buckle on the Bible Belt. You heard the Bible Belt? That's like where everything is right there. That's uh, you walk into the grocery store and they're playing Christian music in the grocery store. You walk into Dairy Queen and they have Bible on the Dairy Queen. But even there, the uh, resistance, the resentment among uh, students at the university, among younger people towards Christianity is, uh, is pretty ugly. And it, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, socially media-induced uh, opinions uh, the, of, of hatred towards all that we stand for and all that we believe. So, what are we going to do? Well, uh, there's a number of options. One is run and hide. Um, that's one option. Another is to get ugly and do the, uh, do the mean, ugly, conservative thing. And that seems to be a really popular option. You don't really win very many uh, friends and influence people that way. Well, the third option is just to hold on to Jesus Christ and try to represent him wherever he puts you. And if he puts us in the fire, we know he's with us there too. Amen. Amen. So one thing that every one of us needs to come to terms with as soon as possible, and, and I, I say this to all of us, but especially to the young people that, uh, uh, God bless these families full of all these beautiful kids and people worshiping God. That's so wonderful. Every one of you young ladies, young men, we need to come to terms with, it. is this thing true? Is this true? Is this, you know, there, if you want an excuse not to follow Jesus, there's enough reason in any family, in any group of people, you can find something to point your finger at. But behind all the, the things that we have to complain about, we need to come to terms with, is this book real? And is the God that these people that have gathered together to worship, is, does he really exist? If he does, then everything he said is true. And that infuses all of life with meaning and purpose. Amen. If he doesn't, I don't know what you're going to do. Go fishing or something. Go do what everybody else does. But if this thing is real, then it's worth everything. Amen? Amen. I believe it is. Fully persuaded that it is. I have so much I want to say today, and there's not enough time to say it all. So we're going to try to hit a few topics. I was trained to always start uh, time in the pulpit 
uh, with a scripture verse, and it's going to be a while before we get back to this because I have to tell about Peru and hopefully show a slideshow here. But let me start off with the scripture verse. I want to give priority to the word and then hopefully get back to at least saying a few uh, words about this. We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58. Paul is winding up his conversation, uh, his teaching, uh, the whole, really the whole letter of 1 Corinthians. And we'll, we'll go to verse 57. Wow, there's a lot of echo there. Do I need to speak louder? I can do street preaching without this. We could do that. All right, we good? Y'all just have to bear with me here. Light and momentary afflictions. All right, we'll start in verse 57. He's been arguing about how Christ has defeated uh, sin. The, sin. the sting of sin, of death is sin, and the sting of the sin is law. But then verse 57, this is his triumphal note right here. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, immovable, immovable. Don't move. Stay put. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your labor is not in vain. Look at the person next to you and say, your labor is not in vain. Even if you don't want to look at them, still look at them and say, your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, we're going to get back to that. Our labor is not in vain. Whatever the Lord's given you to labor at, it's not in vain. Hallelujah. That's a good thing to remember because there's a lot of voices that would tell you otherwise. So I've been introduced already. My name is Gary Tebby. My wife, Amelia, is in the back. My youngest son, Bracey, is with us. I think I've mentioned already. Bracey's in junior college uh, studying business. His older brother is in Fort Worth uh, studying medicine. My son, uh, Benjamin, in Fort Worth, he walked into a coffee shop uh, a few months ago. He said, Dad, you'll never guess. I walked into a coffee shop in Fort Worth, and I ran into uh, Leah Macias and her family. Good friends and, and family in Christ. It's a small world in big cities in the kingdom of God. You never know who you're going to run into. So uh, we, are, we have lived all over the place, but we live, moved, started in, in uh, Peru. Oh, 2010, uh, we, we moved back to Peru. My wife is originally from Peru. I used to work as a ministry there many years ago. Um, I met her the first day I landed in Peru. And I thought I could speak Spanish, but I couldn't speak Spanish well enough to say, um, will you marry me in Spanish? <laughs> so it took me a couple years, but she finally said yes. We celebrate 25 years next month. 25 years. Praise God. It's possible. Looking forward to the next 25 years. They say it gets easier after the kids grow up. Hallelujah. It's been a wonderful bumpy ride. We were, um, uh, we had to go to Peru uh, just a few weeks ago uh, for um, my wife's father passed away. And so we stayed there longer than we intended. Uh, there were storms and we were coming back and uh, we flew from Lima, Peru, the capital, to Houston, Texas. And so as we're flying, it's a six-hour flight, and outside of Houston, about an hour out, the pilot comes on and said, oh, this is your captain speaking. That's always scary, because we're not landing yet. And he said, there, we thought that it would be gone, but there's a giant storm outside of Houston, and uh, we're going to try to avoid it, but we're going to have to go through a little bit of turbulence. Do not use the restroom. Buckle your seatbelt. Do not get up. And no extra coffee. Basically, he told us all to sit down and don't get up. And the stewardess actually had to get on someone's case because he wanted to get up and use the restroom. And then we went through turbulence. Anybody ever been through turbulence before? Okay, if you haven't, you will. <laughs> and it was, and the, the, God bless America, United, United Airlines. They drove us a big old loop all the way around that thing. But it was bumpy the whole way through. And I thought, you know what? This is my life. This is my marriage. This is my ministry. This is parenthood. This is living in this world. It's bumpy, and it's really uncomfortable, and you spill your coffee, but you're going to make it. Amen? Amen. We're going to make it home, and we did. Praise God. And I'm never so happy to get off an airplane as when we get off that airplane. <laughs> the Lord brings us home, and he's going to bring every one of us home. So we've been on this bumpy ride for uh, quite a few years. Uh, we work in... Um, I teach uh, Bible and Christian history at Calvary Bible Institute, at Calvary Commission. I'd love to talk this whole time about Calvary Commission, but we're going to focus on Peru. It's really a great ministry up in Lindale, a small town outside of Tyler, Texas. Um, 
doing fantastic work. Uh, since Peru is where we, we focus on, that's what we'll be talking about. And I'll show you a slideshow about the work there. Uh, we spend most of the school year here in the States, and then every chance we get, we're down in Peru. We'll be going back there for the summer in two weeks. Um, we started a church, uh, Escuela Cristiana de los Andes, Christian School of the Andes, and we started a, uh, I'm sorry, the church is Iglesia Esperanza Viva, Church Living Hope, and then the school is Christian School of the Andes, uh, both uh, in the city of Wanaco. Wanaco is a place that you don't go to unless you're lost. You, people go to Machu Picchu, millions of people go to Machu Picchu every day. We're not Machu Picchu. We're way off the Inca Trail. If there's any Americans or gringos that get over there, it's because they don't know where they're going. That's, it's not a famous place. It's a big city. It's got like 300,000 people. Uh, but it's all packed into the size of Bulverde, city limits. They're right there between two mountains. A lot of, it's not uh, known for much, uh, but uh, there's people there, and God's there, and Jesus is there, and Jesus loves people, and that's why the church goes to where people are, because that's where Christ is, and so that's where the Lord has allowed us to work, and we, we do other things in other parts of the country, but that's the main focus. Uh, so, Church of um, Living Water has visited us on several occasions. I cannot remember the last time I was here. I think it was the whole of human history is divided the before COVID and after COVID. So I think it was BC, before COVID, <laughs> last time we were here. I know that um, I almost went to Bracken Christian School today till I was informed that you guys were over here. So it was way back in those days back in the, the last time we were here, but it's wonderful to see everyone. And for all those that have visited us, reciben saludos de los hermanos de Peru. Everybody in Peru sends greeting to the congregation here. So uh, we've had people from uh, Living Water visit us in times past, and all the brothers and sisters send their greetings back to you in the name of Jesus. All right, so I want to try to do three things today. First, uh, a word, share our gratitude. Second, share updates. Third, share the word. So the first main reason I'm here, and if I don't get to do anything else, let me just do this. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. That's one thing I want to do, say thank you. Um, thank you on behalf of the brothers and sisters in Peru. Thank you on behalf of my family. Uh, thank you for giving to us financially. Thank you for all that faithfulness for all these years. Uh, thank you for coming down to visit us several times. Uh, thank you. Years ago, a uh, group from this church put together a great promotional video for us. We really appreciate that. Uh, thank you for covering the cost of our website every month. Uh, thank you for praying for us. I've been told several times, we've been praying for you. We really need the prayers. We thank you for that. Thank you uh, for standing with us. Thank you for caring about people that most of you have never met on the opposite side of the planet, but the same side of the kingdom. Thank you. Thank you. The, the result of that, only heaven knows. But I'll tell you what, there's kids that are in school that are protected and loved and, and being taught because of the giving of, of this congregation. There's children who are now adults and, and uh, have gone through college and are working and have been, uh, that went through our school that were protected and loved and given a Christian education because of the giving of this church. There is a church right now actually in service. We're on the same time zone now and they're worshiping the Lord. And there's people who were not worshiping the Lord not too many years ago who are gathered together and praising and serving Jesus Christ. And so thank you for that. Uh, we are very grateful. The Lord uh, will reward you. I have a friend from Spain, and he always says, says, every time I do something for him, he says, que Dios te paga. May God pay you. I said, the Lord will pay me, but you owe me. <laughs> <laughs> so... I at least owe a, a, a debt of, of thanksgiving to everyone here. Uh, thank you for not giving up when the going gets rough. That's a theme I've said already, and I just want to keep saying, don't quit. Thank you. Thank you for your investment in Peru, India, and I know many other parts of the world. Second, I want to give an update, and I'll, I'll have to just be concise. Here's the negative side of things. COVID hit us hard. Hit anybody else hard? The lockdown hit us hard. The death toll hit us hard. The craziness of the country hit us hard. Uh, Peru had one of the most severe lockdowns of any country in the world that I read about in the news. 
Uh, they declared martial law um, for the longest time, for months. Men could go out on Monday, women could go out on Tuesday, men could go out on Wednesday, and uh, they, they had just a really rough time. And on Sunday, nobody could go out. They shut down churches for the better part of a year. They shut down schools for most of two years. And so there's a lot of, a whole generation of kids that didn't get, I mean, they got kind of an education, but they didn't get really much of anything for, for the last two years. Just last year is when things first started to open up, really. They had military uh, police out there. If anybody was out past curfew, like 2 o'clock in the afternoon or early in the morning or at night, they, you would be arrested and uh, fined and put in jail. And even in the jungle, they put people in the stocks. Like, really, literally, they, I've seen videos that put people in stocks out there in the cities in the jungle. Um, they prohibited our church services for months. We had, like everybody else, use the, use the technology. Um, we, uh, they shut down schools. Uh, they hurt us pretty bad, but they didn't stop us. Basically, our, our little school is converted into um, something like an undercover homeschool co-op. <laughs> Anybody relate to that? <laughs> All the first-generation homeschoolers know what I'm talking about, how you do things like that when they don't want you meeting together. But uh, we're, we're a handful of, of, of kids, and, and a few of our families actually are homeschooling. A couple of mothers, they decide, you know what, we're just going to homeschool our kids. They're in different places. So they're homeschooling under our covering and auspices. And then we have a teacher, a full-time teacher, and a, a part-time teacher that are teaching our, the, the few children that we have. Um, we've, we've lost a lot of people. Um, every... At one point, Peru had the highest death toll in the world per capita. Uh, I think the United States or China probably has the highest death toll from COVID, but Peru had the highest death toll per capita. And I can testify firsthand, every, we live in a kind of a thick neighborhood where everybody's very close together. Every block we live on some, in that neighborhood, somebody died. Our neighbor across the street passed away. A man at the end of the street who his wife would come to our church, he lost two or three family members. There's a house further on in the neighborhood that uh, all the adults, everybody, there was no children, everyone in the house died, older people, that the house is empty. And so uh, that affected the, the whole country. Um, uh, anyways, just a lot of craziness. My wife's brother-in-law uh, passed away uh, from COVID. Uh, he died in the faith. He died um, in Christ. But he died. I, I have to give a testimony about him. Um, he, the short version is this. When I married into the family 25 years ago, he and I really didn't have that many conversations. If anybody has in-laws, you understand how that goes. But this was an in-law that was kind of an outlaw and, and um, lived a really bad life. I didn't know when I married into the family what he had been involved in and been doing. But... Um, it, if it gives any indication, his firstborn son was named Lenin. His second son was Stalin. For real. <laughs> and so then he had um, five children all together. And my wife's sister came to faith in Christ and prayed for, what was it? Quantos años? 17 years? She's saying 19 years. She prayed for years. Lord, save him. Lord, destroy the coca fields. And he would come in and see her praying. And he said, what are you praying for the destruction of the coca fields for? That's where our money comes from. And she said, Lord, save him. Lord, destroy the coca fields. And anyways, he was a hard-headed, hard-hearted, arrogant, um, proud, uh, ugly individual. And her daddy told her not to marry him. <laughs> Listen to your daddy, girls. Listen to your daddy. I've never seen it go well. He, he, they married when they were young, and then he went into a really, really bad life. And years she prayed for him. Years and years. And he finally got so bad in everything he was doing, she said, you know what, leave. You need to leave the house. And he said, he said you, it's that preacher you've been listening to. That preacher at your church told you that. And she said, You're, you are a mess. You're bringing a shame, and I can't live with you anymore. You need to leave. And so he went to go chew out and probably beat up the pastor. He went to the pastor's house, knocked on the door. He said, oh, bienvenidos, come on inside, let's have a talk. And so the pastor had him sit on his couch, and after Odilon said everything he had to say and got it all out of his system, he said, okay, you're done yet? No, and then blah, 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 blah. Okay, are you done yet? And he said everything he had to say, and the pastor said, well, thank you for sharing that. Now I'm going to tell you something. And he said, you have a wonderful wife. You have five beautiful children. They come to my church. Anybody in the world would love to have kids like you. Have, and you are the most selfish, 
egocentric, evil man on earth, and you're going to die pretty soon, and you're going to burn and go to hell forever, and you will not be able to escape because you are a rebel against truth. He used to come in church and mock people. He'd go in these little country churches and mock the pastor where his wife would go to. And he was going to a larger church in the city. And when he said, you're going to burn to hell, um, my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law, old Elon, remembered a dream that he had had where he was burning in hell. And fear took hold of his heart. It's called the fear of God. It's a good thing. We need more of it. <laughs> and so he started trembling. And instead of beating up the pastor, he said, Ora. He said, pray for me. And the pastor said, you need to repent. Repent means you stop. You need to repent. You need to turn. And he said, see, see, see. And he actually got on his knees crying, convulsing, and asked God to forgive him. And the pastor prayed for him, and he repented and surrendered his life to Christ. Amen. Now, most conversions aren't that dramatic. Every conversion is more dramatic than that because every conversion requires a miracle. He changed. He's like, stop drinking. Stop doing all the other stuff, and you can fill in the blanks and imagine he was doing it. And for the next, let's see, 17 years? That was 17 years ago, right? For 17, that's where I got my 17 from. For 17 years, he followed Christ. When we came back to Peru to go visit that summer, he was in church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, caminando por la senda. My wife couldn't even uh, sing. She was just staring at this guy. Imagine the person you know that will never get saved. You think, that guy will never, mocking, blasphemous, arrogant, that's the person that Jesus is going to save. Amen? Amen. And, and then he dies suddenly from COVID, left five adult children who loved him. And I'll tell you what, every one of his kids are, are followers of Jesus today because they said that Jesus that saved my daddy is worth following. And they saw the before and they saw the after shot. You know, like Weight Watchers before and after. They saw Jesus. People are watching Jesus in you. And they see the before and the after. They know it's real. So these kids knew that his faith was real and the Christ that he served was real. And they're serving the Lord to this day. And they, several of them are married and have children of their own. But after he died um, last year, after he passed away, of course, it would just hit us. And we, we were grieving and we'd go down to the family, even though it was kind of dangerous to be down there in Peru. We were scared. We went down there. Everything was fine. We didn't die. Uh, he, and, and we're... And we're visiting a family, and then people start to come in. He traveled all over the, uh, the country doing, he sold vehicles, and uh, uh, his family had a, they started a construction business, and so he had to travel a lot. But we started to hear feedback from people that knew him everywhere he had traveled. Now, you know, after someone passes away, that's always the uh, kind of a cringy moment because you think, oh, no, all the bad stuff's going to come out, you tr especially someone that travels a lot. You hear the life he lived. Well, here was the real him. Um, we found out that he was helping widows and orphans, and everybody that he talked to, all his old buddies, said, man, he would never chase women. He would never get drunk. One thing he did, he was always preaching to us about Jesus, always telling us that we need to follow Christ, always encouraging people. We had a politician come and show up, and he had been a business guy, and he said, this man, I owe everything I have in my life to this man because he's the one who encouraged me to get involved in politics. And I thought, ooh, is that a good thing? I don't know. <laughs> but... The guy left a testimony all over the country for 17 years. All those years of following the devil and then 17 years of following Jesus Christ. And the Lord took him home. Now see, you, there's how, how you look at things determines how, how you respond to what's going on. He died. We're grieving. It hurts. I really wish he could be there. His, his second son uh, said, I wish my father was here because our family business, we're making it, but we're like a table with only three, with a three-legged table with two legs. We're missing one of the legs, and it's wobbly, and it's hard to keep it going, but we're going. So there's that side of things. But the other side of things is everything we believe is true. Amen? Amen. The more we go through really uncomfortable, unpleasant, ugly, horrible, painful situations like death and grief, the more we see how real everything that we've been holding on to is. Have you had that experience? You will. You will. Um, I, how could I? I can't tell everything that's been happening in Peru. It was crazy. Politics went crazy. Uh, they went through three presidents in one week. I think we have problems. <laughs> they went through three presidents in one week. Um, they asked the, the, the janitor, and he said, I don't want the job. One after another after another. They, uh, that's a joke. Now, everybody wants a job, but they can't keep it. 
They elected just a year ago one president, first time they ever elected an openly communist president. Not somebody accused of being communist. They, their party was like praising Mao Zedong and Karl Marx and, and Vladimir Lenin and, and, um, and uh, everybody. Uh, Fidel, they really like old Fidel. They went through that. I'll just, we're, we're broadcasting, aren't we? Que viva! Hallelujah. Here's the short version. That president's in prison right now for corruption, and his vice president's there. And then they started rioting all across the country. Just, this was last month. And then um, in the middle of the riots, while we were there, and it messed up our plane trip to get back, um, they had something they'd never had. Peru is on the Pacific Ocean. It's like California. It's right on the coast there on the map. Big country right on the Pacific. It's called the Pacific Ocean because it's supposed to be peaceful. Nothing ever happens there. And for the first time in 40 years, they had a tropical cyclone. And so it dumped all this water on the desert where it never rains at, and they were had flooding all throughout the coast, uh, and houses were, were collapsing. Uh, but one of the unusual side effects of the cyclone is that all the protesters got wet and went home, so they don't have the rioting anymore. And, and um, one of the things I was going to do was invite people from the church to come, but then I thought, you know what, if once they hear about all this, they're not going to want to come but you guys are invited to come to Peru. <laughs> now, the positive side of things is um, God's at work there. God's at work there. And actually, actually, things I've stressed some of the negative things. They've calmed down a lot. For these past two, since COVID, there's been no Americans that we've seen every time we've kind of snuck into the country and come back. Uh, but now uh, the airports are full of gringos coming in and the tourism is back and there's uh, Asians coming in. Everybody's going back to see Peru. So I think things have calmed down uh, quite a bit just in these past, probably about the past month. All right, good stuff. Your labor is not in vain. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look, that's not just to put on the refrigerator. That's just not a motivational saying. Jesus gives us the victory. God gives us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If Jesus is your Lord, God's going to give you the victory. He's going to give you his victory. If we're doing what God has called us to do, and we are walking as God has called us to walk, he will give us the victory. So I, I've shared the victory, the testimony of this man's uh, life that was changed through those years. Um, my wife and I started a church. Her brother, uh, who was an agricultural engineer and, and worked in and uh, numerous other businesses resigned all that, and he and his wife took over the church and little school that we started. So uh, talk about a baptism by fire into the ministry. Not very many years after he gets, he's in the ministry, we have COVID hit, and they have to figure out how to have church. Everything's shut down. And then it had the most unusual ministry. People started calling him from all over the country, uh, desperate, and saying, I'm, I'm sick, my family member's sick, uh, we're, we're we heard that you pray for the sick. Can you pray for me? And so he did. And they had over 60, 60 people uh, pray to surrender their life to Jesus Christ. And uh, several people who experienced just very amazing uh, supernatural interventions of God in their life. There was one gentleman that uh, was kind of a rascal, uh, like highway robber man. That was his job. He would go and rob buses and things like that well-known in the, in the village up uh, outside the city. And uh, his daughter had called and said, can you pray for my dad? He's got all kinds of problems, but there's a demonic presence that's tormenting him at night. I know we don't like to talk about stuff like that at church in the United States, uh, but that was what was going on. This guy couldn't sleep, and he was terrified this thing was coming into his room. There's a lot of occultism up there. And so he was, he was like about to lose his mind. And he called, uh, they, they put him on the phone with uh, Abel, our pastor. He prayed with him, and the man slept like a baby that night, and it says that he still sleeps fine to this day. Surrendered his, he surrendered his life to Christ. That daughter and uh, her son, his daughter and her, and her husband uh, visit our church now. They're in and out. They're, they're not totally committed to Christ, but they're, they're not far from the kingdom. And we've seen story after story like that. There was another man um, that had... AIDS, and then got COVID, and was in the hospital in the, uh, where they put the tube in, and was at the last, they didn't expect him to make it through the night. AIDS and COVID, two really, really bad combinations. You don't want to get both those at once. And they said he's not going to make it, but he prayed with Abel on the phone, or Abel prayed for him over the phone, and um, he got better. 
survived, went home. And as far as I know, he's still marching forward. Anyways, uh, the church is growing. Uh, it's, uh, uh, there's about, I'd love to have this place. You guys are so blessed. This is, this is even better than the gym before. We do not have space to put people. Uh, in, 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 in Peru, we were, had overflow, and we had to sit out on the street of our little house. Now we have another, uh, basically it was an old house. We tore out the, do- the walls, and we made a room that's probably about this, about this much space right here. And uh, so uh, that's where the congregation is meeting right now. They're right in the middle of service. Uh, when we get there, our plan is to expand the space, put a roof over it so we can have more space to meet. But the Lord is working. Uh, so many things I want to talk about, but I'll tell you what. Oh, oh, this. One of my greatest joys was being able to perform several baptisms last year, right after the wave of COVID. In fact, it was kind of funny because uh, it might be in the picture there. The baptismal candidates, um, be- they have these rules like here, you have to wear your, your mask. And so several of them are wearing masks as we go into the water. I said, you guys got to take your mask off because we're going to get you wet here. But it was just the... There, But the Pastor Abel had been preparing them in the months before, and then we went out to this cold river with not much water, and we got everybody wet and baptized, and uh, they're serving the Lord to this day. Praise God. Okay, let's, let's run the slideshow now, and uh, I would just, uh, just want to show this, give some faces to these people that we're talking about here. Might help if we dim the lights up here. This is a music list slide show. Oh, we got music. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Just want to skip past that one. You may have to manually move it. There we go. My sons and my wife enjoy my life. That's our little city right there in Peru. That's Peru, right there on the Pacific Ocean. That's really uncomfortable to wear a mask for six hours. I don't think it helped very much either. They actually put us on that plane and then took us off it. This is going home. Now, this makes me nostalgic. No problema. Eleven million people in the capital city. We live up in the Andes. It's about a 12-hour bus ride from the capital, or it's a 45-minute uh, plane trip. That's a little city, right? A little town. That's our city, Huanuco, Peru. 310,000 people. That's out in the jungle. My son took this picture. Bracey's a wonderful photographer. It's Millie and I. Making the trek through the jungle there. Real picture. We snapped that from the highway right there. Beautiful place. Come with us. Preferred mode of transportation. It's my little sister, my wife, and some of her nieces going up to the village there. On an ancient road. The mysterious land of darkness. The music was nice, by the way, and light. And tears. As are uh, COVID burials right there. of wrath, lots of protest. Perfectly fine when they're not protesting. All the riots of beauty. Those are some of our kiddos. We got to be a part of a wedding. One of our young men in the church. There's shepherd girls up in the mountains. A land where everyone is friendly. 
My son informed me we ate that chicken. And the locals loved to talk and surf. It's a real deal. That alpaca actually surfs. The guy trained his pet alpaca to surf. His name's Pisco. Welcome to the table. We were preaching in the jungle. They gave us delicious fried bananas and chicken there. Friends work together. There's 9,650,000 children in Peru. She's making bread there. Climbing trees. Best buddies. Her pet turtle doesn't actually have a turtle inside there <laughs> anymore. So there's our home. It's called the City of Eternal Springtime because it's always 75 to 80 degrees there. That's us right in the smack dab in the center of the country, right between the mountains and the jungle, in the mountains close to jungle. Hope for the homeland. And then the letters don't come out here for some reason, but it's Jesus Christ is the hope for Peru. So here's a few shots of the, of the different things we're doing in ministry. I'm actually at a cemetery there where we, we preached uh, preaching at a public school. They invited me to preach to the students at the public school. My wife's teaching. I think she's being a mother to everybody in the congregation. I think that evangelism at a funeral, that's another funeral. Funerals are our form of social interaction there. That's our social life is going to funerals. We get more opportunities to meet people. Home church. Home church. Uh, the, the settings are off on this, but this is Abel preaching at an open-air funeral. They're, they're all at the, the burial there, and uh, two families that were going to fight reconciled right there, and they actually all started crying and asking each other for forgiveness. Two brothers died one day apart from each other, and they were gonna, their families were fighting over the inheritance, and he was preaching, you need to forgive each other, and you need to be reconciled, and they did. There's, you can see all the people there. There's a lot more than you see in that. And uh, after he finished, right, just like a few seconds after this photo is snapped, uh, they, they, one starts crying, they all start crying, and they all hugged each other and asked each other for forgiveness. And make disciples of all nations. I love getting to preach in my sandals next to the river. And this is an, that was one baptism, this is another baptism. See some of them in their COVID masks there. Baptizing them. There we go. There's a husband and wife couple there on the end. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. He's leading a Bible study with some workers. That's our pastor Abel right there. And share the word. There we are doing video just like here and everywhere else in the world. That's our, our new building where we've tore out the walls and that's where they're meeting right now. They fixed it up a little bit better since this first shot right there. That's, we teach, there's a million with the kids in the jungle. That's our little, some of our elementary age, Christian school of the Andes. She does not look like she's having a good time with that mask on. He's working hard. I'm not going to tell you who won the chess match. <laughs> Pastor Al designed that wonderful logo for us. Wow, that shouldn't, that shouldn't be there, but these, this is supposed to say teacher training at the bottom there, that black line. Bookworms. Anybody here like to read? Hallelujah. I knew I was with friend, family. <laughs> homework. Come on, smile. You smile for the camera, buddy. Smile. You love homework. Archery. He's smiling. He's smiling beneath that mask. Our church donated, from here in Texas, donated these uh, uh, bows and arrows for the kids. 
it's a, a graduation uh, ceremony, I think, with the, the families. <laughs> Students at Christmas. This is a, a graduate. He's uh, studying engineering at the university now, civil engineering. She uh, graduated. She's studying environmental engineering. She's also uh, graduated from an English school and uh, teaches English and history to part-time. She's our part-time teacher as well for our school now. And these are uh, graduates and future graduate there. And behold, I am with you always. It's a rainbow of our city, even to the end of the age. Welcome to the harvest. Praise God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And the key is in the Lord. If you're in the Lord and you're doing what he told you to do, then your labor is not in vain. Amen. Eh, what are we supposed to do? Well, the church has a job. We're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations. And families have a job. We're supposed to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, make disciples of our families. And every one of us has a job. We're supposed to labor with our hands and glorify God with everything we do. Amen? You know, if Christ is at the center of what we do and what we say, then life is infused with meaning. If he's not, then you're in a bad situation of trying to find what's the purpose and meaning for this. We were sitting in the hotel lobby this morning eating breakfast, our waffle that they had for us, and the news is on, and I try not to watch the news before I preach, but I couldn't help uh, but uh, get this little bit of information. They said suicide in the United States is up and depression among youth is up. And all these really negative mental health issues are uh, skyrocketing. Well, it's not just the United States, it's all over the world. And there's a lot of reasons for it. But I'll tell you one thing that contributes to our declining mental health and uh, suicide is the lack of purpose the lack of meaning, the lack of direction. If you don't know what it's, we're here for, you don't know what you're here for. And the promise that, well, you just, you make up your own meaning. You invent what you want. You invent truth. You do you. <laughs> you find out what works for you, and you follow that direction, and that will, uh, th that you will find satisfaction in that. But you know what? Uh, your purpose in life is only as good as the one who's making up the purpose. And it doesn't take very long for you to realize, uh, if I'm the one who invents my purpose in life, I'm nobody. Who might invent purpose? I could choose one thing or another. I could choose to do something very bad or something good, but who determines what's good and evil? If I determine what's good and evil, what's purpose in life? Maybe you guys don't wrestle with this, but I did when I was a young person. I was totally not a Christian. And finding the gospel of Jesus Christ was the greatest thing in the world. Because all of a sudden, I find out what the purpose of life is. Has anyone ever had that discovery yet? Amen. It's to know God and to know, and know that God loves you and receive God's love and give God, gives God's love to others. I don't have to come up with something that I don't even really believe in the first place. God defines who I am. God defines what I am. God defines where I'm going. If you allow God to define you and define where you're going, then your life is infused with mission, with purpose, with direction. If you try to do it on your own, you're on your own. And we see where that's getting us. Totally on our own. In this, this passage right here, Paul is concluding really his whole, uh, his whole 
letter, and he's dealt with all kinds of, of issues in Corinthians, and he, he winds it down talking about, uh, about the resurrection. Uh, he's, every word's important. I won't go through it all, but I'll say this. He starts off with, in my version, therefore, and uh, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let me give you the short version. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit working. Don't quit pressing on. Keep going forward. Don't quit. That's the short version. Why? Well, the first three words change everything about the passage. He says, therefore. That tells us to look back what he said before. And I read the previous verse. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you can live. You can keep pressing on. That's how you can be steadfast and immovable. Oh, man, things are so difficult. How can I keep going on? How can I be steadfast? How can I be immovable? How can I hold on? Well, look at the therefore. Point you back to everything that comes before. And it says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul has been teaching about resurrection, and he's been teaching about Christ's resurrection and our resurrection with him. Because Jesus rose from the dead, uh, we get the promise of a new body. If that's not good news, it's because you're under 40. Once you turn 40, getting a new body is a good thing. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. As you get older, you sit, wow, there's a lot of benefits to this whole Christianity business. I really like that one right there. No more dieting either. Death is horrible. My wife, the reason we had to go back, she just lost her father. Uh, he died in the faith. He died at age 94. Praise God. And he died, he couldn't hear very well. We had to write uh, out messages to him, and he, but he died with everything else working. He had strong opinions about everything. And, and he was sharp all the way to the end. The last conversation I had with him, a few weeks before he died, uh, he, said, uh, he said, let's go to the jungle and build a house. He was always planning. That's another thing. People that make it a long time, they don't sit around watching reruns. They, they do things, and they're always active, and they don't quit. God did not make us to sit in front of screens doing nothing all day. He made us to go build houses in the jungle and go hunt things and eat things and build things. And so Papa Avelino made it to the very end. But he was, uh, uh, I'll say this about my father-in-law. He, he, he was raised to fear God. And he had, how many? Eight? Nine. Nine children. And he taught all of his children to fear God. And he married a woman who feared God. And he taught them to uh, to take seriously the things of God. And when they finally had permission to read the Bible, they weren't allowed to read the Bible, but when they finally had a permission to read the Bible, he went and bought a Good News for Modern Man Bible in Spanish translation from a nun. And he got his family to read that Bible. And they read it. And it opened their heart. My wife said, I remember thinking, wow, if this is Christianity, then I don't know what Christianity is. And when they finally heard the gospel, the message that Jesus Christ saves us, by grace through faith. When someone had the boldness to come and preach that in their village, the whole family converted. Their dad had prepared the way years before and said, this is, there's, there's a, he told the kids, my wife says she remembers a little child, her dad saying, I've traveled and work and I've met these other people out there. They're better Christians than we are. They take God seriously. And he said, everybody makes fun of them. If you ever meet them, don't mock them because they're better Christians than we are. And they said, oh, I always wanted to meet these people. I thought they were like angels. She said, now I know they're not angels, but they're people that fear God. And, and so we've become part of those people. What kind of people? People that take God seriously, people that believe the gospel, that Jesus saves us. And so grandpa led his family into faith. Their family became pillars of the faith. He, he was faithful to the end, and he finished well. And, and the Lord took him in the most gracious of ways. He said he didn't feel well the day before. Uh, that, that morning he had breakfast, sat down on the couch. Usually he would take a nap, but he said, no, I'm going to sit down on the couch. He turned to his granddaughter, who's a niece, first graduate of our school. Uh, his, his granddaughter, who's a, a, a nurse, my niece, a nurse, grabbed her hand. He said, me voy, hija. I'm going, daughter. Looked at her and turned his head to one side and died. I want to go like that. Either that or just shoot me preaching the gospel. Just turned over and said, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And they just went home. But it's still grief. 
And, and death is still terrible. And, and as you get older and more and more people that you know and love pass away, it gets, it's, it's painful to face it. And I don't know, especially for those that are younger, I don't, don't know if they told you this when you were born, but you're going to die. Every single one of us in this room is not going to be here. Unless we're here when Jesus comes back, we're all going to have to go through this death process. And so that makes everything really serious. Uh, how do you deal with death? How do you deal with that? What do you do when you're in a country and everybody is falling apart because they don't know how to handle death? It's everywhere. It's here. It's, it's on the other side of the world. Uh, they built a new hospital for COVID just a few blocks away from a nephew of ours, his house. And uh, they said that people would stand outside the hospital, family members. Uh, they didn't have an ambulance before, but now they had an ambulance. And the ambulance would only go to the house of people that had COVID, put them inside there, and take them in the hospital. And most people that went in didn't come back out. I don't know if it was the treatment or the sickness or what, but you go in, you didn't come back out. Our brother-in-law, he didn't come back out once they took him in there. And they don't allow family to visit. There's no, it's all like, people in hazmat suits and everything, like some kind of terror, dystopian movie. And so in the dust in front of this hospital, just two blocks from the house, uh, people were crying and screaming and kneeling down and praying and praying to the saints, praying to Mary, praying to God, praying to the angels, anybody save my family members. And they're dying. And they oftentimes wouldn't allow a family to be at the, at the funeral. Our family, they made a special exception. They had people in hazmat suits come and bring out the brother-in-law I mentioned earlier. And they had everybody stand at a distance and they bury him. But they couldn't have a normal funeral. They all had to be at a distance. But they had to bury him like two hours after he dies. So it was just a shock. How do you deal with death? How do you deal with that? Because it's a reality we're all going to face. Pandemic, 94 years old, car accident, cancer. Every one of us has to come to terms with that. And how you live in life in the light of death determines how you live. Much of our culture, this country, is an escape from reality. And it's escape from death. We think we're not going to die. We always want to be forever young. We're trapped in perpetual adolescence. And the people that deny the reality of death are condemned to be forever immature. That goes from the top of society all the way to the bottom. Everybody just wants to be uh, forever young. We're not going to be young forever. We are all going to pass away. We have been given a very short amount of time to live. What are we going to do in light of that time? It behooves us, every single one of us, especially those who are young, to come face to face with these things and ask ourselves, do we really believe what this book says? Do we really believe this message that is proclaimed from the pulpit uh, Sunday after Sunday in a church? Is this, is this all true? If it is, then that changes everything. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only hope I have. I'm, I'm fascinated by economics. I try to encourage people to use wisdom in politics. Um, I'm all about you know, my, my son's studying business and he wants to be successful in business. I think those are all wonderful things. But you know what? The, the answer we have is neither political nor economic nor any other solution. Our answer is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the only hope I have to give to anybody. And the Lord allows us, every single one of us, to go out there in a hopeless world and interact with people that are trying to find something. Most people are trying to medicate themselves into oblivion and just forget about all the uncomfortable and pleasantness of life. But we have hope in Jesus Christ. Christ takes something evil like death and he turns it around for good. It's still evil. It's still an enemy. It's the last enemy to be destroyed. But it's not. He takes the sting out of it. We were at the front door and the kids found a little scorpion. But it was a dead scorpion. It was good because if it wasn't dead before, it was dead by the time they got rid of it. <laughs> but, but the sting of death... The terror of it, the horror of it. Oh, my, I don't like this. This is awful. But he takes the sting out of it. How? Because it is a doorway into the presence of God. For those that are in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's nothing better than this. There's nothing better than this. To be with Jesus. Here's, here's the way I think. Man, I, I really wish I could do what? What do you really enjoy in life? 
My sons find joy in jumping out of airplanes and snowboarding and skiing and things like that. I am excited to grow uh, cabbage and <laughs> read books. I'm okay with that. You guys can have all the adventure. Too. They find joy in doing that thing. But think about the thing that brings you joy in life. That's only a dim reflection of what God has for us. Everything that tastes good here on earth is just to whet your appetite for what God has prepared for us in heaven. We have to have this heavenly mindedness to get us through earth and all that it has for us. There's a, uh, I, I may have mentioned this the last time I was here. I'm fascinated by this. It, it, I get this from uh, uh, Ralph Winter's missiology course, but some, several people have been to San Francisco and seen uh, the, uh, uh, the ship that was used in World War II. And uh, was it Queen Anne? Half of it was a luxury liner before the war. It was, it was a luxury liner before the war, and they've, they've turned it into a museum, and half of it is set up like it was when the luxury liner. So you have these big tables, and you have uh, ornate chandeliers and so on. Then during World War II, it was turned into a... Uh, a it was used for the war. The, the Navy used it to, as a fighter ship, and the, the conditions are cramped, and you see all the beds where the soldiers slept, and you see the mess hall, and you see how the difference between a luxury liner and a ship that's used for war. So here's the question. Are we on vacation or are we at war? How you perceive life will determine. If you're on vacation, then you look at things very differently. You want everything to be nice. I just stayed at this little nice hotel. I would recommend it. We'd stay again over on 281. But as soon as we got there, on my email, it popped up. Uh, they want me to answer all these questions. Was the house cleaning just right? Was the, was the, did, how did they treat you? And, and you're supposed to fill out, and you put your varying degrees of happy faces on there. If you're in the mentality of, I'm on vacation, then you want a lot of happy faces. But things look differently when they're shooting at you, and you're just happy that you made it through another day. <laughs> Amen? And you don't expect everything to be comfortable and easy. Now, by the way, it was a really good hotel. They, I put little happy faces for them. They were good. But when you understand, I'm not here just to play and have a good time. God has given me a mission. God has given me a purpose. My life is enfolded in the bigger purpose of God. You have to see your life as part of God's story. Uh, I think it's Black will be experiencing God. He says, don't ask, what is God's plan for your life? Ask, what is God's plan, and how does your life fit into God's plan? Do you see the difference? Our, our culture, Burger King, tell us your way right away. We're very... Egocentric, we're very market driven, we're very consumerist, and so uh, we have this idea that everything exists for us. What will satisfy me? What will make me feel good and, and happy and fulfilled in life? It's not about being fulfilled in life. You want to find fulfillment, here's how you find fulfillment. God, what do you want me to fulfill? How can I be a part of what you're doing? And when you understand that your life is one page, one paragraph, and one, one page in God's book, then you say, Okay, Lord, how can I be a part of what you're doing in your story? That infuses everything that you say and do with meaning and purpose. And it gives you direction. And it says, okay. And, and things get rough, and the, the flight gets bumpy, and there's turbulence, and they don't serve you the kind of food that you like to eat. We say, well, praise God. It's all right. I'm not here for the food anyways. Amen? Amen. We're here to fulfill the mission God's given us. We're here to complete the purpose he has given us. Um, Praise God. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Uh, steadfast means hang on. Don't quit. There's a lot of people quitting. Have you seen people quit? All right, I'm not going to ask for any hands, but have you ever been tempted to quit? Have you ever not been tempted to quit? Be steadfast, immovable. It means don't be shaken. It means be unwavering, at least in two areas. One, in what you believe, and two, in how you live. God calls us to be steadfast in our faith. There are so many ideologies. There are so many alternatives. There are so many other things other than the truth out there. And they're all on your cell phone. Is this true or is it not? Sooner or later, every one of us has to decide, and I, I say this to 
every adult here, and I say this to every young person here, your parents have loved you. You are so blessed. You guys really, really are blessed. I hope you know this. You guys are really, really blessed. Many of the adults here did not have the privilege of having uh, the kind of protection and care and effort and, and pouring into their lives that you had. Some did. Many of us didn't. It's like the bumper sticker about Texas. I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I can. Same thing about the kingdom. Many of, most of us weren't born into a Christian family, but we came in as soon as God opened our eyes to the truth. Thank God for that. But you've been given truth. But there comes a time in every one of our life when we have to take possession of what's given to us. And you've got to determine, is this real or is it not? Now, if it's not, I don't know what you do. If it's not, I have nothing else to say. Go fishing, go watch Netflix, do, go do whatever everybody else does because you're in big trouble because there's nothing. But if this gospel is true, then it's worth every bit of our lives. Is what Jesus died for worth what you're living for? If, if he is truly he who died and rose again, and he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and he will come back to judge the living and the dead, and he is interceding for every one of us right now, and his spirit is working in our heart to turn us away from evil and to turn to good and to make us like Christ, if all that is reality, then it deserves nothing less than yes and amen. And it is worth me responding by saying, yes, Lord, I will hold on. I will hold on to what you said is true, and I won't follow lies, and I won't believe it even if it's convenient. I see a lot of apostasy. I see a lot of uh, falling away from the Christian faith. I wonder if they ever had anything in the start, to start with. There's, there's the pretense of an intellectualism about it. There's the, uh, I'm talking about here in this country. Uh, there's the, the, just the popularity of, of being uh, atheist or agnostic or denying one's faith. You know what? In every person that I know, it's not ultimately an intellectual issue. It's a heart issue. People have not abandoned Christianity because uh, it is not true, because they were really diligent seekers after the truth, and they found, oh, wow, look at all these, the, 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 this er error that we find in the gospel. They've abandoned Christianity because they want to go do something else. I want to be boss. They didn't like God being boss. I want to be boss. I want to do what I want to do. And then your brain follows your heart. You know that's true. Your brain follows your heart. So what's your heart following? You will look for justifications for your apostasy or you will submit to true, God's truth. If you love the truth, you follow the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen. And then he says, he says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I'll just say this about abounding in the work of the Lord. It means doing it joyfully, and it means doing a lot of it. Amen? Abounding in the work of the Lord. If you want to serve God, you will never be bored. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> you won't be bored. How are we supposed to work for the Lord? Well, I mentioned at the beginning, and, and I'll just say this again. God put Adam and Eve in the garden not to sleep. Ha hammocks came later. Praise God for hammocks. He gave them a job. They were supposed to be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. So work in itself is an act of worship to God. Our work is worship to God. And then beyond that, we are called to serve one another in love. God gives spiritual gifts to the body of Christ so that we can benefit and build up one another. God has given you spiritual gifts. I believe I was uh, converted and lived in South America afterward, lived in South America, and, and I've always been a part of a Christianity that believes in supernatural uh, work of the Holy Spirit. I believe in all the spiritual gifts, even the spiritual gifts people don't like to talk about, like helps and serving and giving and administration. <laughs> All those spiritual gifts that are kind of behind the scenes that actually get things done, we need those spiritual gifts a lot. Everybody likes the noisy spiritual gifts, but we really need those other spiritual gifts as well. Hallelujah. God, how do you find your spiritual gift? Just start serving. Just say, Lord, how can I help people? 
What can I do? What can I do at church? What can I do with the body of Christ? What can I do to help people? And God will show you. And then there's ministry where God calls people, some people to preach, some people to teach, some people to go overseas and plant churches, some people to rescue orphans. There are ways to serve God in ministry that God calls us to. We are supposed to be abounding in that. And, and abounding means doing it with a joy and enthusiasm. With, like like you, my old pastor used to say, like, do it like you mean it. Yeah. He was telling me to, about raking his yard, but <laughs> the principle still applies. <laughs> Yeah, I was just thought he should be happy. I was just raking his yard. He'd come out and say, do it like you mean it. <laughs> okay, yes, sir. Do it like you mean it. <laughs> Amen. I have a friend, a Baptist uh, brother that is, uh, does youth ministry, at, well, uh, university ministry at the college that my son goes to, and he has an ap- a place where they do apologetics, and they bring in young people, and they talk, and He's been doing it for decades. He's in a wheelchair, but that hasn't stopped him. Old used to be a bull rider. Now he's, a, he, he's trying to reach out to these, these kids. And I asked him one time at a wedding he was performing. I said, uh, what, how have you seen uh, ministry change over the decades that you've been involved in, in student ministry? And he said, well, uh, he said, we have so many, I don't know what it was, 80, 100 something Baptist churches that support us as we do this ministry. He said, but I've seen this. He said, in the past few years, you can't, uh, everybody's tired. He said, it's hard to get anybody to help. We used to be, not too many years ago, about 20 years ago, up until then, we always had people that would help and, and, and serve and, and do our different events and, and things. He said, now, if we can get anybody to help, it's a major event. And then afterwards, they're all so tired. Why are we so tired all the time? What's, what's draining our energy? I think it's the cell phones. I really don't know what it is, but he said, everybody's just really, really tired. If we can get anybody to do anything. If you're doing what God calls you to do, and you're doing it in the joy of the Lord, it's not tiring. It's energizing. It's empowering. I mean, you'll be physically exhausted afterwards. But it's a kind of exhaustion that says, let's go do it again. Why? Because it's not in vain. It's not in vain. In Spanish, por gusto. No es por gusto. It's not for no reason at all. You know, uh, I feel like um, uh, somebody who's just kind of tripping along, making a lot of mistakes on the way, trying to do what I believe God has called me to do, going down a lot of alleys, backing up, saying, oh, that wasn't right, let's go this way, running into all kinds of unexpected turbulence along the way. I don't know if anybody can relate. I always admire people that have their act together. I've never been one of those people. I admire people whose lawn is always perfectly cut and their their homework is always done well and everything always looks good, and I just think, man, that is, I'd love to be like that. But I keep pressing forward And I know that soon I will be where my father-in-law was, whether at 94 or 49 or whenever. I know the day's coming soon when I'll be at the end of my life. And what I fear most is not looking back and saying, man, you lived a crazy life. That doesn't bother me too much. What I fear most is looking back and saying, it was for no reason. You did a lot of stuff, looked good in the eyes of a lot of people, but God does not say, Maybe everybody else said, but God doesn't say that. God doesn't approve. God's not a fan. I don't want to do that. I want to find God's will. I want to do God's will. I want to run the race and come to the end and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you. Amen. And it will not have been in vain. It will not have been in vain. Doesn't matter how it looks. Doesn't matter how many likes you get on your social media. What matters is, does God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's not live a life piling up vanities. The world does not have an alternative. All they have are distractions. There are so many rabbit trails to get off. There are so many distractions that take us to the left and the right. That is not the way that God has called us to do. He has called us to live in holiness. He's called us to live in love. He's called us to live in truth. And if we pursue those things, and when the Holy Spirit convicts you, repent. Because he's going to win. He's bigger anyways. 
Just say, okay, Lord, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. Show me what to do. And he'll show you. And when you get to the end, you'll say, it hasn't been in vain. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who gives us a victory. I invite you to stand with me and let's pray. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for loving us enough to tell us the truth. And thank you, Lord God, for pulling us out of darkness. I pray, Lord, you would make yourself real to every single one of us, whatever stage we're at. Some are at the very end, some apparently at the very beginning of their journey in life. Holy Spirit, please make real your word to us. May we live in the victory of Christ and share that victory with those around us. And may our lives not have been in vain. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, our God. Amen.